The way in which science is incorporated into the policy is a more complex issue than meets the eye. And there are at least three questions that need to be asked. The first is, does science have any privileged place in relationship to another knowledge-based system in policy formation? Does science have a privileged place? The second is, how does the changing nature of science the way in which you answer that first question, and in particular how the way in which science advice is actually provided. And thirdly, you come to a practical aspect which, given those first two questions are answered, how do you actually incorporate scientific advice into the policy and political framework? Now, I'm going to focus on those three questions, although you can't entirely separate them. So in the way I talk to you, there'll be some of them to play between those three, three questions. Now, I think at the start, I'm going to make an assumption, which I think is a reasonable one, that democratic societies make decisions and policy on many inputs. But underlying it all is the question of what kind of decisions government to want to make. And I think we can assume that while modern social, that modern social democratic governments, subject to staying within the ideological framework of the parties in power, the governments do really want to make good decisions. I think if you don't have that as a basis, you can't have any faith in the democratic process. But the issue is how do they make their decisions? And my view is quite clear, but quite simply that the use of high quality information and evidence should be at the core of decision making processes. And that decisions made in the absence of informed background material are by definition made on the basis of dogma and belief. Uh, this, therefore, this is less likely to be effective and efficient and have the danger, as we'll talk about later on, of entrenching policies which can be actually harmful or little value. In making that statement of my own personal position, I'm really making a statement about the positioning of scientific knowledge. Now, what I'm going to argue, and it's really getting beyond the postmodernist perspective, and argue that we should, we can accept that science, as we understand it, is somewhat different to other forms of knowledge. That it's the only process we have to build reliable knowledge about the natural and built, built world. And that other than that, the only real other sorts of knowledge we really have are those effectively of experience, belief, or dogma. And how one gains experience is, of course, influenced by what kind of process was used in getting there. This is an important, if not essential, point for the particular authority of science is intimately associated with the particular nature of science. And that's really a key point. What is science? I would suggest to you that science is not a series of facts. It's not a series of statements of fact. It's, a, it's actually a process by which how those facts are obtained. And that that's what defines ultimately science is a process underlying it. It's not my view, the view which a number of philosophers of science have put out. I'm going to expand particularly on this as this talk of evolves, but for the moment it's just stick with the traditional Baconian appearing view of what science is. Now I always find it funny that Bacon is Hans Bacon is associated with this because Bacon himself never did a scientific experiment in his life, never became anywhere close to doing a scientific experiment. But we've come to view science in that model as, a, as an iterative process of experiment and observation, hypothesis testing, reformation of hypotheses, new experiments. And in some way, at some point, the knowledge appears to be seen, to considered as reliable and accepted as a statement of what we know. The key point is that science in that model is not the facts themselves, and science is the process. 
science is a process by which, as Jonathan Marx, the philosopher, pointed out, by which we make our best efforts to understand what's going on in the universe, in the natural and social world, and in ourselves. And to think scientifically, there are a number of tools. Ideas about cause and effect, perspective of evidence and logical coherence, curiosity, intellectual honesty, the willingness to create a hypothesis, the willingness to discard ideas in the face of evidence, they are the core skills of the scientific process and of scientists. Now that is the traditional simple model of what I would call linear science, the kind of science that most, of, most people think science is, the kind of science that leads you to know what the speed of light is, the kind of science that leads you to conclude that birds are descended from dinosaurs, etc., etc., etc. Now, the, the issue is, if we even accept that point, how would you incorporate, why would I argue that science might have a privileged place in policy formation as opposed to other sorts of knowledge? And the best way I might use to explain that might be an example. The other sources of making of knowledge are those really of intuition, belief, and dogma. And there's examples abound of the different impacts of, of decisions made on belief, uh, intuition, or dogma. Now, an example that comes from the 1980s is perhaps the most dramatic. It would sound intuitive be commonsensical that formal driver education would be a good thing. That teaching young people to drive within a formal pedagogical framework at school would reduce the rate of road accidents. And in the 1980s, literally billions of dollars were spent in the Western world, particularly in North America, but also in New Zealand, Australia, and in Europe on putting formal driver education into the high school programs. Mothers against drunk driving said, got to do that, reduce the instance of young people killing themselves or injuring themselves. The insurance companies wanted it. Everybody said, that's common sense. Let's do it. A few scientists said, don't do it. So, and they were ignored or, or vilified. In fact, someone would give it to another rough treatment before the US Senate. But they insisted that doing it was not the right thing to do. Well, driver education came in. Billions of dollars were spent. The scientists keep saying it's going to make matters worse. The, the social scientists, their data was ignored. Until in the 1980s, because of a financial crisis in a number of United States states, those kind of, the, the educational systems there stopped doing driver education because they couldn't afford it. And the rate of road accidents started to fall quite dramatically, and injuries and death rates and adolescents fell quite dramatically. Finally, the proper studies were done and demonstrated that indeed, where driver education was formalized at school, road accident rates and for adolescents went up, injury rate went up, and so forth. Now, what had gone on was quite obvious in that if you install driver education, then the pressure is put on by young people and their parents to let them get a driver's license at a younger age, because everybody's doing it. And the younger people get their driver's license, great, there's a linear relationship, inverse relationship between the age that you get a driver's license and you're likely to be having a prank. Secondly, if you had the children, people who went through those programs actually were more overconfident and drove in a more overconfident way than people that have not been through those programs. Now, that's a, now, that's a classic example of where common sense says it's logical to put in, dri to put in driver education. The scientists said it may not be logical, test it first. And common sense was overruled by scientifically, scientific empirical data. We have many other examples. 
A lot of them, another one which is in a very similar domain, is drug and alcohol education in high school. Common sense, drug and alcohol education work. Does it? The most commonly used program until it was banned by the United States Department of Education was DEAR, Drug and Alcohol Body of Education. It was shown definitively when it was properly assessed that it increased the use of drug and alcohol by young people who not produce the instance of drug and alcohol use by young people. We still have it, believe it or not, in some places in New Zealand. I can't believe it, but we do. And if we go further and just think about this further, if you don't know what's going on, if you don't monitor what you do, you can't make rational decisions about programs. So if you look at the if you look at the OECD report on adolescents and young people in New Zealand, and the work in the OECD country, came out in 2009. They make a statement about New Zealand which points out that New Zealand spends considerable amounts on single parent benefits which last until the children are late in their teenage years with the notion that this promotes child well-being. There is an international consensus that there's little or no evidence that these benefits positively benefit child well-being. And of course, this is a reference to domestic services. Its argument when it was introduced was that we have to give solo parent families a benefit for the benefit of the child. And we maintain it until the youngest child, I think, is 16. Around the world, there are many solo parent benefits used, but in general, with the exception of New Zealand and I think Australia, they usually stop when the youngest child is fine. And there's a $200 million difference and between in New Zealand but stopping at five and stopping at sixteen. Now, the OECD might be right, or the OECD might be wrong. We just don't know. Because nobody's ever done the research. We do not know whether sustaining in New Zealand in the context of the families who receive this award in New Zealand, whether a prolonged child benefit is a good or a bad thing. There are arguments why it might be a good thing. There are equally arguments why it might be a very bad thing. It might be as a delaying the mother getting back in the workforce, developing her self-identity and self-esteem, because the child has a sense of a current dependency and so forth. Equally, there are arguments that something one makes is a good thing. But the problem is nobody knows. But because it's common sense is it must be a good thing, Governments are stuck with spending several hundred million dollars, which may or may not need to be spent. But there's now no way to evaluate it. There's now no way, late in the piece, to collect the data to know whether maintaining it was a good or a bad thing. And so that's an argument which says governments get trapped by not having information about the programs they implement. And through and through and through, keep finding that we don't, governments invest a lot of money in programs which have dogma and belief driving them, and nobody knows whether they work or not, but once they're started, they're politically impossible to stop. I suspect there's literally billions of dollars spent each year in programs in New Zealand, which if they were evaluated properly, nobody would have ever invested them in the first place. And these examples make another important point. Well, information and evidence do not themselves make policy. Good information and evidence provide an important base for the rational assessment of options, which are the proper thing of policy makers and politicians to use. I do not claim and do not believe, and I've said I've been quite insistent, that science does not make policy. Policy makers and politicians make policy. It's quite proper and in fact required in a democracy that other things are overlaid over a knowledge base in making policy. What's the impact? What's the public opinion? What's the fiscal value? In some cases, what are the diplomatic 
consideration. All of those things and the political process all must are appropriate parts of policy formation process. But my argument is, and I'll qualify it in a few moments, my argument would be that all those things operate best when applied against a, a proper understanding of what the knowledge base is, what we know, what we don't know, and against a solid, a consistent, values-free, or relatively values-free, and I'll come back to that point in a moment, values-free assessment of the knowledge base, then it's proper for the values-laden components which are impact, value for money, cost, relative priority, public opinion, political ideology, etc., etc., can be overlaid on it. But if those things happen in the absence of having a knowledge base, then basically the politician is falling back on dogma and belief, and you end up with the issues in the two examples I gave you. Now, before discussing the values question, I want to talk a bit about the changing na the second question I pose, which is the changing nature of science itself. Because I believe it's critical to understand that, to understand where I'm here. Science has changed dramatically, but most people don't realise how much science has changed dramatically. Most people see science as a reductionist process about which some certainty is obtained about a certain fact. And yes, there is there are large specific elements of specific reduction of science. The bridge will take so much weight. Birds are or are not descended from dinosaurs. This drug has these side effects and so forth. Those are all reasonably linear questions where in general, some level of precision is possible. And in that context, science can be seen as authoritative, definitive, and used to be accepted in that sense by a very different public and politician. In those matters, people like me are not needed because the expert can provide direct advice and you don't need an interlocutor. But the nature of science has undergone a radical change. For the last, since really about 1900, when bo modern biology started to appear, we started to see, and then quantum physics appeared and so forth, we started to see science willing to grapple with complex non-linear phenomena, where certainty is not possible, where there remain many unknowns, and answers become defined in terms of probabilities and levels of uncertainty. Climate change, food security, environmental sustainability, the impact of an aging population, population policy itself, uh, the impact of increased urbanisation, the impact of a more wide society. These are the issues, sustainable energy, etc., clean water, these are all very complex non-linear systems where there is an important scientific component, but to pretend that science can produce authoritative answers is wrong. It's just not possible. And yet these are the very issues that are of high public concern and political complexity, and the very matters in which governments and public turn to the public scientists, such as myself, upon. And such science by its very nature is intimately linked to and intertwined with the values and concerns of the public and the body politic. And this is where the issue of science and values comes together. Now many scientists deny it, but most philosophers have pointed it out for centuries that values always play a role in science. Now, where they play a role in science traditionally have been in what scientists choose to study in research ethics and funding decisions. Scientists have always insisted that the process of obtaining the results and interpreting any sets of observations 
a value free. But let's not kid ourselves. Science has always had, and scientists do have values, and those values have determined what science is done and what science has done has, has not done. But in complex science, an additional factor arises, and this is really the key factor. And probably the philosopher who's pointed out that out best is an uh, American philosopher of science called Heather Douglas, who wrote a book called Science Policy and the Value Free Ideal. And she and the issue to her, and the issue is I think the right one, is how much uncertainty is acceptable when deciding whether the science or the knowledge should form the basis of an action or a policy. The key question becomes, when is a particular body of scientific work adequately sound to serve as the basis of policy? And in asking that question, really asking how much evidence is sufficient, how reliable the studies underpinning the evidence, how much uncertainty is acceptable, and what are the risks associated with an erroneous conclusion in either direction? If you think about those, those are all very value-laden questions. They're ju questions of judgment. They're value-laden questions. And the issue that I question, that I think is the most important one in that regard, is what is consequences of an inductive error? If you think about it, the most important thing a public scientist in providing advice does in, in relationship to public decision making is what are the response and the implications of an inductive error in either direction, premature action or premature inaction. There's a term given to this kind of science called post normal science as opposed to normal science, which is the more traditional form of science. And it's defined by the people who invented this term, which I like far better than the ultimate term of wicked science or complex science, as the application of science to public issues where facts are uncertain, values in dispute, stakes are high, and decisions are urgent. Now, if we just use climate change, anthropogenic climate change as an example, there's a body of knowledge out there that argues that the world is warming and there's anthropogenic climate air, air, causation for that global warming of climate, something I probably accept, I might say parenthetically, but put that aside for a moment. If, we ex if the conclusion is that the world is warming and the world takes action against it, because of the deal of anthropogenic warming. And it turns out that that conclusion is wrong. What have been the consequences? The consequences is how that the world has probably spent some money on some mitigation that's not needed. We've cleaned up the environment a bit, we've had a number of other, so there will be an economic cost, but there will be a number of other benefits in terms of better energy security, better use of alternate fuels, clean environment, and so forth. If the conclusion, however, of the scientific community had been that the world was not warming and recommended no action by the global community, and that conclusion turned out to be wrong, and the world was in fact warming, what would be the cost? The cost would be far greater. So it's not, an ace, it's not a symmetrical decision. The amount of data that a public scientist needs to have to reach a conclusion is not related to the consequences of getting the response right. It's actually res related to the consequences of getting the response wrong. So you have to be by you, you have to, if you think of a person in my position, it's the consequence of inductive error that's the biggest concern I have to make. Now, that is the hardest decision one has in the role of a public scientist. It's not a matter, I'm never dealing with certainties. I'm always dealing with uncertainties. After all said and done, we will not know what the world's temperature will be in the year 2050 to the year 2051. 
when we look at the time record in 2051. We have no way of being certain. We can have models, we have a high. I mean, as, in this particular case, I think by far the weight of scientific evidence points to there being an unacceptable fast rate of anthropogenic induced global warming. But nevertheless, every model has no return to it. Now, there's a further issue in all of this, and, it, and I'll come back to the climate change in its example in a moment to highlight another aspect of this. And that is when science is used as a proxy in a debate about values which science is no longer or little longer. And that's a very dangerous position. Now, the classic example of that is abortion in the North American context of the 1980s. In the 1980s, I, when I worked in the, well, I worked in America in the 1970s, and I was still doing a lot of work in America in the 1980s. As a person who worked on development, I would be frequently asked, when does human life begin? And of course, the debate being driven by protagonists on either side of the abortion debate. And they were asking people like myself, as scientists, to define when human life begins. Well, I can't define that. I mean, it's defined by what word you mean, how you define the word life. As an evolutionary biologist, life is a continuum that started when the first replicating bit of <laughs> RNA happened, you know, several billion years ago. But of course, what people were wanting was to avoid what was actually a... The, the only debate about this is a values debate. At what point does one value a certain bit of human cells as an individual as opposed to not being an individual and given certain rights. A perfectly valid discussion to have, which is one for society to have about belief and values and rights and religion and so forth, but it's one which the scientific community cannot answer. It's not a scientific debate. Now we have the same thing going on in climate change. Largely, climate change debate is not a debate about whether the world is warming or not. When you peel it away, most of the protagonists on the so-called skeptics side of the debate, I don't know if we're skeptics, but you know what I'm talking about, actually do accept that there's a level of anthropogenic global warming when you peel it away and you talk to them here. The issue is whether we have to do anything about it now. The issue is really a values debate of intergenerational equity. Do I have to make a sacrifice now because we have to make some economic decisions to reduce the rate of global warming when the benefit is not going to affect me, the benefit is going to be in one or two generations' time? Or do I have to make a, an investment now because I'm worried about the next generation and I have a responsibility for the next generation? It's an issue of generational equity. It then has a scientific layer put on top of it, which is, doesn't need to be there. Those who say, well, we can leave it to another generation, say, technology will solve it in the future. Ironic that they argue about the scientific conclusion of today that the world is likely warming to say that there'll be a scientific solution to a problem if the world is warming in a generation's time. Now, it's very tricky business, it's very tricky territory, and I state, and I think it's very wrong for the scientific community to get drawn into these debates, which are values debates, where science is used for a proxy for what should be a proper debate within society over values, over intergenerational equity, over, over uh, one beliefs about abortion or, or stem cells or anything like that. The scientists cannot answer that question. They may put on the table information, which is necessary information, about, like what is a stem cell, what do we know about when the human brain becomes active in, in fetal life, what do we know, what is the evidence around anthropogenic global warming. But they shouldn't enter, they shouldn't go beyond that into what is a values debate. Because all of their values are no different than anybody else's values. They have no more authority. I've never, I'm not arguing that science, coming back to my original question, I'm not arguing that science has an authority, a particular base in policy making 
for values. I'm only arguing in the particular place in policy making for the knowledge it provides and which other domains are placed. It's a subtle but critical difference in my mind. And so when you look at my role, my role as a public scientist is effectively to be sure about what I'm communicating both the politician, the policy maker and the public. I've got to be explicit about the assumptions, limitations and uncertainties underlying the evidence and present the knowledge base and the options that emerge allow for their full range of possible benefits or adverse effects to be appreciated. I'm not expected to be expert on anything or everything. That's not my role. I'm actually acting as a broker between the science community and the policy framework. In the case of climate change, I know very little about climate change. What I know about is the process by which the science of climate change has been developed. And I know that and I know how to look at the evidence in those terms. And it's how that brokerage is conducted that's the key issue. There's a book called The Honest Broker by Roger Pilkey, who's actually a climate scientist uh, from Denver, no, from somewhere in Colorado, but it's from the other university city in Colorado, Boulder, who himself is somewhat middle of the road about his views of climate change, which is somewhat irrelevant. But Roger, in his book, The Honest Broker, distinguishes between two kinds of advice about complex or post-normal science. That of being the issue's advocate and that of being the honest broker. Now, the issue advocate is exactly what it is. The scientist is advancing evidence to support a position where the position has been staked out in advance of the evidence, either because of his personal beliefs or the beliefs of the people he's working for or with the organisation. Now that's quite appropriate that organisations use scientists in forming their positions for advocacy. But that's not the role of a science advisor. That's that, that all said and done, that person is what they are. It's no different for the advocate an expert witness for the defence or for the prosecution in a, in a legal case. The scientist comes in filtering the evidence to support a position that he or she takes. Of course, they don't claim to be filtering the evidence, but that's what they do. Now, issues advocates are bound throughout the scientific domain. Most scientists conflate the, their values and their, with, with, their, with, with, with their objectivity. Genetic modification of food is safe, genetic modification of food is not safe. You will find issues advocates who have scientific degrees on both sides of that coin. Already in making that point, values and science is often being conflated. And the reality is there's no, absolutely no scientific evidence that genetically modified food is unsafe, other than if it has an allergen in it, which has been exaggerated. On the other hand, that doesn't mean that genetically modified crops are necessarily good for, a, for an ecological system. The jury has probably spilled out on the ecological consequences of genetically modified crops. Having said all that, there's an appropriate values debate which is entirely independent of the science. A particular country or, or, or society may want to be genetically modified free because of a set of values and perceptions they have about clean and green or natural or, or whatever. On the other hand, their perceptions will likely change over time as people become more comfortable with certain technologies, or they may not. For example, those of us are old enough to remember back 35 years was the horror that associated with infectious fertilization. How could we do, be doing such a thing? How would we be allowing people to be incubated in a test tube or a petri dish and turned into a human being? Quite a debate for a period of time, not just on religious grounds, but on quite broader cultural grounds in many societies. Now, of course, there'll be other than those who object to the way in which the over and sperm are collected on religious grounds, IDF is a well-accepted, non-debatable 
matter in our society, which has absolutely no contention about it whatsoever. So people's views and acceptance of technologies changes. And so separating these issues out means that scientists to maintain their credibility, at least public scientists, have to be very clear about what they are. And so a true public scientist, in my view, or one involved in the policy making process, has to take another approach. And that is that which Roger called the honest broker. Here the evidence is summarised in a value-free way, insofar as it can be achieved, remembering I've, I've already accepted that, that there are values in every judgment one makes in science. Is this evidence good enough? Is this paper a good paper? Is this, what, is, what is the sufficiency of evidence? This is what, and so in that framework one would say, this is what genetic modification means, this is what we know and what we do not know about genetic modified by food from the perspective of human health. This is what we know and don't know about the impact of genetic modification on ecological systems, etc., etc. One doesn't comment on the values perspectives, saying that's a matter for policy makers and for the public to opine on what is natural, clean and green, what is organic. This word organic always makes me laugh. All food is organic. Uh, the concept that we can eat something that's not organic is strange, but it's been transmitted into something else to mean something else, as you know, as you all know. Interesting side, sidebar, parenthetical. So those issues of values are not directly a role for me as a science advisor. However, a good science advisor knows that how we communicate science to the public will influence the values that the public consensus reaches at any point in time. And therefore, I try very hard, I don't always succeed, and I don't think I succeeded as well in the first year in the job before I come to understand these issues as I do now, and saying, this is what we know, this is what we don't know, these are the values components about which my judgment is no better than yours or anybody else's on and has no more validity than anybody else's on. Try and identify and separate out the knowledge component from the non-knowledge component. That means I have to be honest about admitting the limits of knowledge but, and be informative about what is known or the implication of what's known and not known. I've got it. When I give advice, I've got to be clear about where biases could exist in evaluating and defining the range of options that arise in analysis. What I'm trying to do is provide the knowledge and scientific basis for options and thus the basis on which policy processes provide and proceed, which includes, as I said before, the fiscal, the public opinion, the ideological, the diplomatic and the other appropriate considerations that governments must take into account. The other trap in all of this is that governments often have to make decisions in the absence of any real knowledge or the presence of very limited knowledge. And there can be a seductive trap for people such as myself who have been drawn into matters about where science cannot provide the answers or there's effectively no answers yet. Beware the scientist who does who's not able to utter the words I don't know. Too few scientists are able to say those words, and yet they're the most important words that a scientist can not answer. Many scientists, and I'm dealing with them all the time over the kinds of matters that I deal with, particularly the social scientists, think that science can be authoritative and that science should determine what policy is. But that's just not on. We don't live in a technocratic society. We live in a democracy. And scientists have the, governments have the responsibility of integrating the other domains that have to be incorporated as we've talked about. The thing is, I've got advice must be phrased in such a way to give confidence, honesty, and authority in what I've put forth so that the policy advisor can then take that knowledge and use it 
about me trying to usurp their role. That's what an honest broker does. And it's how that's done which ultimately will determine whether the science arises as the trust of the public and the policy maker. I think around the world, science advisor, which is a new concept, really only dating anywhere from the mid-1980s or 1990s, although there were people with those roles prior to that that was using the context of military uh, developments uh, in, uh, in the United States and the Kingdom, for example, is it requires skill on behalf of the advisor and a good understanding of the integrity and the integrity of both the bureaucrat and the politician, these model these these roles to work. I think what we're seeing, and I think the adolescence example is a good example of that, is that governments are realizing that the role of science advisors can change the nature of a, of a debate and allow a natural, natural national conversation in a different way without political polemic than would be otherwise the case. If we just use the example of the adolescence report as an example, what happened there? Well, early after I became Prime Minister asked me to take this role on, he and I were having a meeting and Prime Minister asked me, look, he said to me, look, there's a growing concern in this country about adolescent morbidity, adolescent behaviour, adolescent mortality, or high suicide rates. What the hell are we going to do about it? I didn't use quite those words, but that's what they came to. And I said, well, look, the usual New Zealand responses to any of something that a problem is you set up a committee with stacked with everybody on it, all the stakeholders on it. It really got a view has to be on the committee, which means the committee can never have an honest discussion because it always walked back to a com political compromise of, of what the stakeholders want. You know, you'll have these people wanting money in the education and these people wanting money in the mental health, and these people wanting to lock more kids up, and et cetera, et cetera. It'll go nowhere. I said, what you want is an assessment of what we know and don't know from the empirical science improves the transition from being a child to an adult. Let's get a summary of what we know and don't know and see if that allows you to come to some logical conclusions of where to go. And so that's what we did. We set up a, I set up a task force which I chaired with Harley Hayne, who's now Vice Chancellor of Otago, who's a social scientist and a psychologist. And we got 15 and actually drew about 30 people all of them are experts. And I said to them, right, I'm only allowed to look at the peer reviewed literature. You're not allowed to look at great literature. And, all that. and the rest of us in the room are going to look at everything that everybody says to see where there's bias coming into your assessment of the literature. And over 18, it took much longer than I thought, it took about 18 months in the end. I wish we thought it would take about six months. We produced a report which, without a doubt, was the most comprehensive report anywhere in the world on. what we know and don't know about the transition from being a child to an adult, and what we know from the point of view of the peer, and only from the point of view of peer-reviewed literature. That report itself was peer-reviewed internationally, so there were layers and layers of peer review. That report doesn't make specific recommendations. It didn't set out to do so. That's the role of a policy maker to reach their conclusion. What it does is it points in some pretty obvious directions. It points to the importance of, of early childhood, if you want to improve, uh, and non cognitive capacity development. If you want to have a better transition through childhood, it's really it points to the economic benefits of investing in early childhood education. If you assess the economic benefit through a longer period of the life course, it points to the deficiencies in mental health services. But it's not for me because there are many other dimensions that come into play to draw all the conclusions together. Obviously, if I'm asked to make a recommendation, I will, I will, I will consider it from the knowledge base, but I can't opine on the other matters. Now, finally, that all lends itself to 
So what I've tried to do in the, in the first two questions is answer the first two questions and give you a view of how I think the third question should be answered. I think we're all still learning. My own view, and I wrote a report which is on the website called Putting Evidence Evidence to Policy or some words to that effect, improving the policy. I can't remember the plus words for the title of the report myself now. It, well, which is actually arguing that New Zealand could use the evidence far better in the policy formation process. That report is widely being discussed in Wellington, within ministries, within agencies, within the State Services Commission, and so forth. And I've been asked to do some different additional work on aspects of it. What it's arguing for, in essence, is institutionalizing what I'm talking about to try and separate out the role of to use science advice and the role of being an honest broker to better improve the access to knowledge about complex decisions, such as the analogy I used around um, domestic purposes benefit. So that there's better assessment and evaluation of programs, both when they're implemented and when they're maintained, and particularly when they go from the pilot level to the scale, because often things are working pilot which don't work when they go to scale. It's very much work in progress, as it is in other countries around the world. I think it's, I think, um, while the position of science advisor exists in every country, not in every country, in many countries, constitutionally it's very different in different countries. I think New Zealand is the youngest one who's been doing it. It's probably taken a lot of lessons from the late Ken Kirkpatrick, who really, in DPMC, worked this role through, uh, really took a lot of knowledge from what had happened in Australia, Canada, UK, and so forth. And increasingly, I think the New Zealand model has been looked at from other countries with some uh, jealousy to see that we may have got it right. Number one, if we separate out the role of science advisor from anything to do with the role of administering the science system. A very different role. Where in Britain those roles are conflated. The, the chief science advisor is also effectively, they don't have it, but effectively the chief executive of the Ministry of Science at the same time. It's got a different type of work, government office of science, but that conflated role. In Australia, the chief scientist actually reports to the Minister of Science, which puts it into a totally different context of the role of the line, and so forth. Um, I think while it's young, it's only been going two and a half years. It's a role that is showing its value, perhaps more so in a country that has not had many public scientists, has not had a very informed debate on a number of matters. If you go back 10 years to the debate over genetically modified organisms, it was never a debate that was based around science. It was a debate that was based on polemic, Frankenstein foods, and it's going to be the savior of the universe by making us rich and wealthy. There was a polemic and rhetoric on both sides and very little around the science. I suspect most people still don't know what a cloned organism means or, what, or, or have any sense of uh, what gen genetic modification actually means in a, in, a, in a sense of what's actually happening to the to the plant or the animal or so forth. And so that the, 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 the lack of public science on those issues was, I think, most unfortunate. Contrast that, for example, and I'm not saying, I'm not advocating it with what happened in Britain, over what I think is quite a remarkable approval, where, where both stem cell research is more uh, broadly accepted than anywhere else in the Western world. And to the extent of allowing chim hybrid human embryos, which makes human and, and, and non-human material in an embryonic form for certain limited research purposes. Something which one could not imagine one could get through a dialogue in New Zealand in the present climate. And yet that was a relatively straightforward public dialogue in Britain over these matters. Uh, 
I think I should stop there. I'm rambling now, uh, and I'm repeating myself. Happy to take conversation, questions, argument, discussion. What I've tried to do is at least give you my views of where in the 21st century science values and policy formation intersect. Uh, and, therefore, and that reflects, in a sense, in what I have to do with my life.